angels team Sin has got no hold on me Cause I am free indeed God is alive We very deep So rise and see Everyone glorify the risen sun The holy one has overcome the enemy spoken underneath the speed Death is crushed in victory Jesus is alive Jesus is alive So let us wake and rise Lift your voices, lift your eyes We're gonna shout, we're gonna shake the skies Cause God is alive We've been redeemed So rise and see Everyone glorify the risen sun The Holy One has overcome Jesus is alive In victory, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Who believes that this morning? Shout amen. The empty grave is singing now, shouting out. He is alive. He is alive. We are free. Come on. The empty grave is singing now, shouting out. And he is alive, he is alive, and we are free. We've been redeemed, so rise and sing. God, Jesus is alive, amen? amen. And we are considered clean because of what he has done for us, because not only was he crucified for our sins, but he rose from the dead. He defeated death so that we have a chance for eternity. Amen.
your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out.
go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, there is no one else for us. <laughs> Lord, there is no one else for us but Jesus. So God, we come into your house, into your sanctuary, and we proclaim your name. Lord, we just pray the name of Jesus today. Lord, Jesus in our family, Jesus in our business, Jesus in our work, Jesus in the secret part of my life that I don't want anyone to know about, Jesus be there. There is no one else for me. There is none but Jesus. Oh God, we're so thankful that you did. You, you allowed yourself to be crucified and you broke the chain of sin and death so that we might live. So Lord, today is a day of freedom. Lord, and we proclaim that freedom over families this morning. God, we proclaim it. Lord, I pray for those people who do not know you yet. Lord, I pray for, 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 for people that might be sitting or standing here in this sanctuary that have yet to experience the awesome, ridiculous, amazing love and grace of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that to, today that, that we might feel a, a heart nudge and, and say, Lord, I need you. I don't know a lot, but Lord, I need you. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. Break down the walls, the things that divide us from your presence. So, Lord, we want more of you this morning. None but Jesus. Many needs come to our minds, and we pray for those that need a special touch from you. Oh, Lord, be with Tim Atman. He's in the hospital. Lord, be with uh, my wife and I and our family with the loss of my, my wife's uh, grand, grandfather. Lord, be with them down in Arkansas this morning. Comfort us. Lord, and many others on our, on our minds and hearts. Lord, we lift them to you this morning. God, be with Pastor Dustin as he brings the message. Lord, that as, as he proclaims your word, Lord, let people hear the words of Jesus today. Oh, God, be with him. Lord, we give you all the glory and the praise. And everybody said, amen and amen. You guys may be seated. This time we're going to take our tithes and offerings. And I'm going to be giving the announcements. So everyone say, woohoo. All right, this is awesome. Uh, in the seat pocket in front of you, there's a Connect card. Please take a few moments to fill that out. Uh, every week, we pray on these on Wednesday nights, and we believe that God is the answer to all of our needs and desires here at Carthage Nazarene. If you miss the bucket as it comes by, you can give your card to an usher or put it in the black box at the back of the worship center by the doors back there. Also, if you knew Carthage Nazarene, this morning we'll have a short 10-minute introduction to Carthage Naz called Landmark. It's located in a room 106, right by the coffee bar. We can answer any questions you might have about Carthage Nazarene to help you worship, connect, and serve. We have a lunch for newcomers coming up. One of our values here at Carthage Nazarene is loving God and each other by connecting with friends. So if you're a recent guest, you can do that by joining us for a wiener roast. Yes, a wiener roast. On, uh, yeah, on October 7th, following second service. That is next Sunday, for those of you that like to know. This is an opportunity to meet a few members of our staff. I'll be there. Uh, I'm preaching next week, so that, no excuse not to show up. All right, here we go. Um, 
Yeah, you can ask questions for me. We'll enjoy some great fall weather around a campfire in the country. Check with the Next Step folks for directions or call the church office to let us know you are coming. October 13th is going to be a great day to eat, fellowship, and have a good time. It is God, guns, and grub, not girls. Let's just make sure we got that correct. We will be going to Shoal Creek, south of Diamond, for a cookout fishing and skeet shooting. All men in the congregation are welcome to attend, and please bring some friends. If you have questions, go to the Next Step booths or talk to uh, Jeff Compton. Uh, Maple Leaf Night of Worship is coming up. It will be here on October 17th, and our community comes together to worship with one voice. It's an awesome time. You need to make plans to be here. It was standing room only last year, and boy, the, the Lord met us here. It was an awesome time. And so be praying as we draw close to one another in our community, our churches, and all of us as one body of Christ. And our final announcement, we have a tailgate party coming up on October 21st, and we'll be broadcasting the Chiefs game here at Carthage Naz, and we're going to be out in the parking lot. So wear your Chiefs gear. If you're a Bengals fan, go home. And uh, <laughs> seriously, you need to rethink your life's priorities. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> all right, how about Patrick Mahomes? All right, here we go. There will be tents, food, all sorts of good desserts. Uh, and so invite a friend and, and come see us at the tailgate party. Thank you, guys. Love you. Through him, we find hope. Through him, we find love. Through him, we find freedom. Through him, that we can be different. 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 Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Uh, you saw that Taryn was sporting a new t-shirt. Those are five bucks out in the foyer, and uh, just encourage you to get uh, some new t-shirts, new uh, uh, gear to wear this fall. And so our very own Anna and Gabe uh, designed this t-shirt. I say we give them a hand. What do you think? Huh? Pretty cool. And so when you uh, see the back side, it's pretty cool. It's our prayer that people will find hope and joy and peace and all the goodness that God has in store here at Carthage Nazarene. It's great to welcome you. It's been a good weekend, homecoming festivities at the school, and it's pretty exciting there, and they won again. And um, Let's see, just, uh, just some great things. Got people home today that have been gone a while, and so welcome, guys. Welcome, everyone. It's just good to be together today. Take your Bibles. I'm in 1 Samuel. Uh, we're looking at the life of David, and... Um, uh, so that we can see how to live life, and we've been using the word different, and if I say, please say that with me, we're going to use that word, so let's practice right now. We're going to live life different. Oh, you guys are awesome, uh, and that's our prayer for our lives today. Uh, on Tuesday morning, it's been taking a group of guys through a book called Play the Man. It's a book written by Mark Batterson. He's a historian and reminded me of a a story from history that I think is pretty powerful. Sometimes you have to look back so that you can see ahead. The War of 1812, Andrew Jackson, he tells the story. They marched more than 2,000 Tennessee volunteers from Nashville to New Orleans. They fought the battle with bravery. It was a decisive battle of New Orleans. The sad irony, I'd forgotten this part, was that the battle was not really necessary because uh, uh, the war had already ended. It took two weeks for the peace treaty to make it across the Atlantic. Well, they, uh, uh, they fought the battle. The battle took its toll on Jackson's troop, but sickness proved to be the deadliest and most dangerous uh, enemy. Over 150 soldiers became ill, 56 of whom could not even stand any longer. And so Dr. Samuel Hogg was with them, and he asked the general what he wanted him to do. To do, sir, Jackson answered, you are not to leave a man on the ground. It wasn't official code yet for the military, but Jackson embodied the motto, leave no man behind. Andrew Jackson ordered his officers to give up their horses to those who were sick, uh, of which the general was the first to do so, and Jackson marched himself 531 miles on foot from New Orleans back to Nashville. It says uh, that Andrew Jackson revered his mother, Elizabeth, and um, he said, There was never a woman like her. She was gentle as a dove, brave as a lioness. He respected his mother. And he said that her last words uh, would echo in his life forever. Jackson said that her last words have been the law of my life. And here are her last words, and this sets the stage for the message today. 
Elizabeth said, If I should not see you again, I wish you to remember and treasure up some things I have already said to you. She said, In this world, you will have to make your own way. To do that, you must have friends. Hmm. I agree for the most part with this uh, concept. Uh, We understand that... uh, Man is self-made, we have that concept, but the truth is, and I think she embodied it in the second part, there are no self-made men, but we need a circle of friends. We need the community, and the truth is, we need the right friends. Uh, Batterson in his book says this, more often than, than not, we become the composite of the people we surround ourselves with. Think about that one for just a moment. Batterson says this, so choose your friends wisely. That's good. What I'm going to talk to you today about is living life, say it with me, different. In order to live life, say it one more time, different, then we have to surround ourselves with the community, with the body, with the friends. And the example that we're looking at here in this study is the example of David And in the 18th chapter, this is following um, the the Goliath scene. It's following Samuel when he lived life different by looking at the heart of man, not at the outward appearance. I mean, literally, God told Samuel, when you anoint the next king, look at his heart. And we prayed together, Lord, help us to see people's heart. Let us not judge a book by its cover, but let us see people for who they truly are. And then last week when we talked about the Goliaths, do you remember for David, Goliath was not a giant. All the other, they were scared of this giant that stood before him. But for David, he was not a giant because the only giant in David's life was God Jehovah. He said, my God is bigger than the Goliath that stands before me. And I asked you the question, do you have any giants in your life? that you need God to take care of. And we stood here at the front as we closed the service, and we said, we want to hold God close. We talked about the principle of proximity. Those things that you hold close become the largest. And when we hold God close in our heart, we allow Him to take us by the hand. The giants that we face, and we all face them, The giants of confusion, the giants of relationship, the giants that overwhelm us, we understand that, will not overtake us when we hold God close to our heart. And today, as we talk about this, my prayer is that we would allow God to do something incredible in each one of our lives. We are in need of community. As I think about that, as I think about the situation of our world, as I think about our society, We're so fragmented. I mean, the trials of this last week really exemplified how fragmented we are. And my prayer is this, that we would allow God to bring us together so that our lives are changed, so that the lives around us are changed. And when we see the example of David, we apply it to our own lives, I believe that we're going to be changed as well. Well, society that we live in today goes counter... to what I'm talking about. Oftentimes we think we can do it on our own. Um, we are there on our, by ourselves. We don't have to have our community around us. And, and it is true. We, we don't have to. I mean, for example, um, oh, uh, well, a couple weeks ago, I had never really done this, but Kara, I sat on the, the couch with her. She pulled out her iPad, and we shopped for groceries all by ourselves there on the couch, just a click here and a click there and a click here. She designated the time that she would pick up the next day, and within about 15, 20 minutes, we, we purchased $150 worth of grocery. We like to eat. Uh, and, uh, and so the next day, she checked in uh, on her iPhone before she left the house. When she pulled into Walmart, her groceries were waiting for her uh, there at the, uh, at the curbside. Isn't that incredible? I mean, we, I mean you talk about uh, uh, convenient, yes. Community, No. I, I'm old enough. Um, I grew up, I would go with mom to the grocery store. It was a mom and pop store. 
Now, some of you, you're just going to say, what are you talking about? But literally, uh, the, the people who own the store worked the store. I mean, the wife, she was the clerk as we checked out. The husband was, was cutting meat in the meat market. When mom would go to pay for the groceries, she literally would say, um, say I, I need that checkbook. Literally, there were checkbooks up on the counter to get the like generic checkbooks up on the counter. She'd say, well, that's the bank we bank at. They would pick up that checkbook. She'd fill in her information. She would sign the check, fill in the amount, and pay for the groceries. Isn't that incredible to think about? And then what seemed like an eternity, we would stand there, and mom and the lady would talk and talk and then talk some more. And the people behind us, they didn't mind it because they wanted to know what mom and they were talking about. <laughs> And then we would go out to the car, a high school kid would be carrying our groceries. Those are the days, I mean, I, I've seen it go from that to a click while we're on the couch. We don't really need the community anymore. And yet, I want to present to you as we look at God's Word, we need the community. We need one another. And if we're not experiencing the glory of God in our life, it might be because we have become so busy in and of ourselves that we have failed to experience the full blessings of what God wants to give to us as we journey together. Well, the scripture that we're looking at today is 1 Samuel chapter 18. Again, we've talked about David being anointed, looking at the heart. We talked about David standing before the Goliath. Today, we're going to talk about the significance of friends in David's life. More than just one friend, but it was uh, many relationships that will teach us today to live in community. I, I, I believe that God's Word presents to us that it was these relationships that prepared David to be king. Now, we know that he had a heart. In fact, it said in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, that David was a man after God's own heart. What we're talking about today is more than just talking about relationships and how to be a good friend. We'll look at those things. But what we're talking about today is, is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of our heart. When we allow God to fill who we are, I mean, our being, how we live life, he changes everything for us today. And today, I believe that God wants to speak to each one of us. We don't need a new method. We don't need a new system. But God, the Holy Spirit, wants to pour into our lives in such a way that we're changed forever. And I believe that's how we live life. And say it with me, different. God's entrusted the message of salvation. He's entrusted the message of love. He's entrusted the message of hope to every one of us who have chosen Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and He is counting on us to share that message. And so when we're in love with Jesus, when we realize that Jesus changes our lives, when we allow the hope to pour into us and fill us up, when we allow His goodness and His purpose, the things that we have found, and if you don't have your t-shirt yet, be sure and get it today, this is what we're about, helping people to find purpose, helping people to find love, to find that hope, to find the goodness, the kindness. And when we allow those things to pour into our lives, the things from great Jehovah, our lives are forever changed. And so those things that come into our life, they have to go somewhere. So why not let it go to the people that we love, the people that we're in relationship with? If we don't give it, then we're not going to receive it. And my prayer is this, that we would receive from what God has in store so that we can share. And I believe that today, God is calling us to live life different as we allow Him to speak to us. And so Jesus, difference, which is actually the norm for Him. Well, chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, here's a, another window into David's life. After David had finished talking with Saul, remember King, and this is after Goliath, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself, a deep relationship. From that day forward, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent David on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all of the towns of Israel to meet King Saul, and they came out with singing, came out with dancing, with joyful songs. And as they danced, they sang, 
Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Now we begin to see some relationships unpacked. I want to teach for just a moment about these relationships, and then we'll apply them to our lives in just a moment. There's four different relationships that we see in the Scripture here. A relationship with Saul, a relationship with Jonathan, the son, a relationship with the community, with the people of Israel. I, I want to present this in an idea of four different degrees of friendship. And this is good for us just to learn and to, to be reminded of. The first one is this, a relationship of submission. Where I get this is verse 2, verse 5, David was with Saul, David went wherever Saul sent him. And so David chose to submit himself to the king's authority. Now, the reason that this is important, because God uses this when we're willing to submit ourselves to one another. He uses this to change not only our lives, but the people's lives around us. Really, think about this with me. And so students, maybe at school, and it's like so frustrating, it feels like busy work that the teacher is assigning and it's like, why do this? Well, the reason that you are to do it is because you're submitting yourself to your teacher's authority. This is a good practice because when you get into the workplace, guess what? Sometimes you have to submit yourself to your employer's authority. Do you understand the concept here? It's good for us to submit ourselves. And so um, and whether it's employees, employers, uh, wherever God has placed us, we have opportunity to submit ourselves, and it takes more of a man to submit himself than it does to fight against it, because we're sure of who we are in Christ. We don't have to prove ourselves. Someone calls us to do it. That's what David did. He submitted himself to the authority. Now, when we translate this into where we live, we could talk about our relationships with our spouse. We could talk about relationships with our parents. We as parents, we need to model this for our children. Leaders, whether you're a leader in the workplace, a leader in the church, wherever you lead, we have opportunity to model this as well. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, and this is before the context of the marriage, and he's talking about the marriage a little later on, but he says, submit yourselves one to another. This is out of reverence for God. And so what that looks like, we begin to be a person who submits ourselves to the authority of people around us. Why? Because our, our life is found in Christ. Our identity is found in Him, not in and of ourself. And that's why David was able to submit himself to Saul. Second relationship is the relationship of affection. He had a great relationship with his friend Jonathan. Verse 1, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. Verse 3, Jonathan made a covenant with God. And the reason that this is significant, and we can learn from this relationship, is because God knew that David needed a true friend to walk with him through the valley that was ahead of him. It was not going to be easy. It was not an easy path as David was to become king. And when we have someone to walk with, journey with, it makes it a whole lot easier. I think Ecclesiastes talks about that. We have a friend who is there to pick us up. And so David and Jonathan, they became close. Now, this is a little side note. Just as I'm teaching, I want to share this with you. But there's some great qualities in this friendship. Verse 4, friends sacrifice for each other. Uh, Jonathan took off the robe, wearing, gave it to David, long tunic, sword, his bow, his belt. Jonathan gave of himself. He sacrificed for his friend. Family, God calls us to sacrifice for one another. We'll apply that in just a moment. Second thought here, friends stand up for one another. Now you have to go down to chapter 19, verses 4 and 5, but Jonathan stood up to his own father in defense of David. We're to stand up for one another, to have one another's back, to encourage, to support. You see, Jonathan, he, I mean, he had everything to lose. I mean, if he was going, who was going to be the next king? It would have been Jonathan. But Jonathan knew that David was God's anointed, and so he didn't let selfishness, didn't let pettiness stand in the way. But he said, I submit, I support, 
because I know that God has called him. Another thing that we see is that friends encourage one another. This is found in chapter 23, verses 15 and 16. Literally, David is at a low point in his life, and it says that Jonathan helped David find strength in God. So we're not just good friends as far as supporting in the things of this world, but true friends encourage one another in their walk with Jesus. This is good stuff, kind of just right there, but it's good stuff, encouraged him. Someone said this, I love this statement, loneliness is the most desperate of all English words. Isn't that wild to think about? Loneliness, people who don't have people around them, they're lost, they're desperate. And that's why God is calling us, church, to be the church, to be the community, to be a friend. And so we learn that here. True friends encourage Family, I want to say this, we need friends in our life, and we need to be friends to others. God's calling us. And I believe the greatest plan for sharing the love of Jesus is friendship. Friendship evangelism. God's calling us to win one friend at a time. And so, four different relationships we see here. Relationship of submission, relationship of affection. Third one is this, relationship of elevation. And where I get this is, is with the people. Uh, Verse 5, whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the military, in the army. This pleased the troops. It pleased Saul's officers as well. Now let's camp here for just a moment. I mean, if there was going to be a spirit of jealousy, it should have been among the officers because, I mean, they were the ones who had put their time in. They had worked their way up through the ranks, and yet David was elevated You would think that they would say, not fair, hey, foul, this isn't right. But no, they did not because they saw something in David's life that was different. I believe the key difference is found a little later in this chapter, verse 14. says, in everything David did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Sometimes we want to live life on our own. Let me just ask, how does that work for you? I mean, it may sustain for a while, but when we get to the end of the day, we don't have a sense of purpose, we don't have the peace, we don't have the joy that Jesus wants to bring to our lives. But David had it. The Lord was with him. And what's key here is the reason that David had it, and we have to go to a Hebrew word for the word success. It's called sakal. I looked this word up. It's used in the Scripture. I found two great insights from this passage that, that, that this word is used in other passages and in two places in the book of Proverbs. And stay with me. Good, good lesson here. The first one is found in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. It says, he who restrains his words are, is wise. The Greek word for wise is sikal. Same word as success, okay? It comes from the same root word. Proverbs 21, 11, he who is wise, sikal, receives instruction. And I began to connect the dots, and I thought, okay, if David was able to be elevated, lives changed around him, people didn't like put him down, but they saw that he was anointed by God, what made the difference? And really, the difference was this. David was one who could keep confidence. He restrained his words. We live in a day and age when people need to be trusted, don't we? You can say amen to that one. David was one who, in the next proverb, was able to be instructed. He was teachable. He had a spirit. Don't you love people who are (laughs) know-it-alls? Not. David wasn't that way. He was willing to receive instruction. And when we put all of this together, he prospered in all the things that he did. The reason was because he was teachable. The reason was because he was confident. He was able to keep confidence. And family, God is calling us to learn from that as well. And so I want to have a teachable spirit. I want to keep confidence. God is entrusting each one of us with the success that he wants to give to us. It was a choice. I truly believe it was a choice for David to keep his mouth shut. It was a choice. It's a choice for us. It was a choice to be teachable, to to continue to be a student, to be a learner. It was a choice God's calling us to choose the same. David's relationship with people grew because 
of his relationship with God. And our relationships will grow the same. And so I want to present to you from God's Word, the closer that we draw to God, the closer that we're going to draw to one another. Our relationship with God affects our relationship with man, with people. And so our marriage, with God at the center of our lives individually, God is going to bring us together in our marriage. That's how it works. We can talk about that with our family, with our children, with our friendships, with our community. When we keep Jesus at the center of the church, the church becomes really appealing. You see, Jesus is not the problem. We're the problem why people aren't here. Because we don't live life the way that Jesus lived. But when we live life the way that Jesus lived, God transforms who we are and people are drawn to Jesus Christ and our lives are forever changed. It's that ripple effect that we talk about affecting the lives around us. So fourth relationship, in verses 8 and 9, kind of unpacks this for us. It's a relationship of opposition with Saul. Then Saul became very angry, for this saying, the praises of the women, displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. The Hebrew word for angry is kara, literally means to burn within. You could say that there was a spirit of jealousy. Family, jealousy will ruin our lives. Please understand that. Jealousy imprisoned Saul instead of leading Israel into bigger and better things that God had in store for them. He focused on making David's life miserable. And if you go through the following chapters of this whole story, you, you see that David continued um, to have... Um, uh, uh, success. He, he continued to prosper. The reason why? It has to do with proximity. We talked about that last week. The closer you hold things to your heart, the larger they become. He held God close to his heart. He was successful. On the other hand, Saul, he was imprisoned. His madness imprisoned him and caused him to lose sight of all of the things that were important to him, even his own family. And family, the same will happen to us if we allow jealousy to come into our lives. It will distract us. It will tear us apart from our marriage to our relationship with our children to things in the workplace. It will distract us. And that's why it's so important for us to choose. David had a choice. We have a choice of how we respond to tough relationships. This relationship of oppression, David chose wisely, and family, we can do the same. I love this verse, Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's just good. Man, we can just close it and say amen right there. That'd be enough. Live at peace with everyone. It's a choice. It's a choice that we're able to make. We're going to learn next week. Taryn's going to bring the word. There's a situation in David's life. I mean, he has a choice. He chose wisely, family. We can choose wisely as well. Three simple lessons that I want to leave with you today. How do we live life, say it with me, different? We choose, number one, to live in community. To live in community in relationship with God and with people. It's a choice. We can either allow things to pull us apart or to draw us together. David needed Jonathan. Jesus needed his disciples. Family, we need one another. We have a choice. Are we going to live in community? You have to be a friend to have a friend, right? Did I say that right? Good. I have to be a friend to have a friend. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us some money. It's going to cost us some energy. You have to give of yourself to be a true friend. That's true, isn't it? It takes time, takes energy. And I simply ask you today, when was the last time you just had a friendship, got together with a friend for, for no other reason than just to be a friend? No agenda, nothing to talk about, just to be a friend. When was the last time that you had someone over to the house or went out for a meal together just because to be friends? 
It's kind of refreshing, isn't it? Kind of takes me back to my memory of their standing with mom in the checkout counter of the mom and pop grocery store, just being a friend. To get together, to be a friend. I believe within the church that no one should ever leave here alone. Whether it's for going out for lunch, you say, well, no one invites me. Well, did you invite anyone? <laughs> it goes two ways, doesn't it? It's time to stop having the pity parties. And it's time to allow God to fill the life and to move on. And say, God, help me to be a true friend. David was a true friend. He had true friends in his life. And his life was forever changed. God wants to change our lives as well. The second lesson is this. Respond to the situations that are hard that come against us with great attitudes by being positive and by being wise. Remember that Hebrew word we talked about, sakal? Literally being teachable. Being a man of confidence. Sometimes we just need to bite our tongue. We need to keep a teachable spirit in our life. That's good, isn't it? James 1.19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That's good preaching. God help us. And if we allow God to help us here, He's going to help us in all the relationships around us. We all agree that God is good, don't we? And when we lift Jesus up, men and women are going to be drawn to Him. And so we need to lift Him up. Don't get in the way. Let people see Jesus through our lives in the way that people truly see Jesus when they see Him living in us. It's a choice that we make. I believe that sharing Jesus is as simple as being Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Allowing Jesus to fill our lives. Ladies, you want to have a good relationship with your spouse, with your husband? fall in love with Jesus. Men, you want to be a good husband? You want to have a deep relationship? Fall in love with Jesus. You see the difference that Jesus makes. And the final lesson is this. Face the future together. You say that's so simple and yet it's so true. Holding the hand of God as He's reaching down from heaven. Holding our hand. Holding the hand of the people around us. And allowing God to bring us together. Jesus wants to change us. He wants to change our lives. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but aren't you thankful that He holds tomorrow? And He's going to lead us. And my prayer is this. As we live life different, that the people around us, that our family, the friends, the kids, the grandkids, that our lives will be forever changed because we chose. It's a choice to live life in community, to live life together. In this world, you're going to have to make your own way. Choose your friends wisely. You have to have friends. I'd like for you to stand with me. And just between you and the Lord today, we just want to pause. I believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to lives today. Some of you, you've heard messages like this many times before. And we know the concepts, but when we begin to live it out, it becomes a little bit difficult. Sometimes it's because of pressure, uh, the, the, the schedules, all of these things that come against us. Let me just say to us, let's not fall for the enemy's trap in letting us get so busy that we fail to live life in community. God help us. Some of you, you've, you've heard messages like this. And when I say Jesus needs to be the center of life, we understand the difference that Jesus makes. But let me just ask you, are you allowing Jesus to make the difference in your life? I believe today, it's more than just thinking back of how we were raised, but today is a day to make a decision to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I believe it's time that we as husbands, that we rise up and we be the men that God has called us to be, to say, I don't have to live life on my own, but we're to live life together. I need to learn that in a greater way. Ladies, we need the support. We need the encouragement. We need you to lead the way as well. Kids, your parents love you. 
Don't push against, but allow the wisdom that God's given to them, to us, through some experience to help you in your life. Say you're in a hard situation, I'm sorry, but God can even use the tough situations that we find ourselves in to transform us. Allow the Holy Spirit to transform today. I wonder, is there anyone here today just between you and the Lord? It is time for us to set the pettiness aside, to say, I'm going to submit myself. I'm going to allow myself to be used to make a choice, to say, Jesus, make a difference in and through my life. There's people who need to know you, and I've been given opportunity. I don't want to be a weak link today. Lord, help us today. Help me. I wonder if there's anyone here today that, man, if we just had to own it, you've taken your eyes off Jesus and you're trying to live life on your own. And when you lay your head down at night, there's not much peace. The mind always wanders. Today, Jesus wants to reach down from heaven and he wants to take you by the hand so that he can be in relationship with you, so that he can change the relationships around you, so that you can have the marriage, so that you can be the parent, so that you can be the employee that God is calling you to be. God, transform us today, I pray. Maybe there's someone watching online today and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you need to get away from where you are today and find yourself in a community. Lord, help us all. All I know is that I want to experience the goodness, the love, the grace of Jesus Christ today. And so Lord, thank you for reminding me through David's life that no matter where we find ourselves, the good, the bad, the ugly, we're able to experience you. So we just pause for a moment. I wonder if there's anyone just who wants to just raise your hand up and say, Dustin, that's my prayer today. Jesus, transform my heart and my life. Help me to become more like Jesus. Is there anyone today? I wonder if there's others. Yes, many. Are there others that maybe today your hand needs to go up and say, I am sick and tired of trying to live life on my own, but today I choose to allow the goodness of God to pour down into my life, to restore the joy of my salvation, and to allow His goodness to fill me so that when people see my life, they see life, they see purpose, they see a hope. Are there hands that want to go up today? Just hearts that want to say yes to Jesus there? Thank you for yesterday's decisions, but today is what really counts. Oh Lord, we love you. We thank you for your great love for us. We just want to experience all that you have in store. We're going to sing a song. If you'd like to pray at the altar, if you'd like to make an altar right where you're at, just experience the Lord. It's between you and Jesus today. When we're finished singing, we're going to do something really special as we close in prayer today. So let's just experience all that God has in store.
Here's what I'd like us to do. I'd like for you to take hands, and um, if you're up by yourself, you'll go back on a row there. Okay, move back, Malcolm. And you guys there, you need to scoot on back. I want you to go ahead and take hands across the aisle. Okay, so make your way. You're going to have to stretch a little bit. Yeah, now get right back in there. Yeah, stretch across. Go ahead. May feel goofy. It's all right. This is the body of Christ. I want you to look around. This is what God is calling us to do. To join hands with Him. To join hands together. God's calling us to make a difference in the lives around us. And the only way that we can do that is when we allow Him to change who we are. So Father, thank You for Your love. Thank You for the grace. Thank You for the goodness. Thank You for the community. The body of Christ. Lord, it's our prayer today that as we allow you to transform us and to transform us as a body, Lord, that people would see you and that purpose and life and joy and peace and hope would be given. So, Lord Jesus, we receive so that it can flow through us today. And I pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that as we go from this place, that we would be Jesus that we would be the body that you've called us to be, that we would be the hope. So that lives around us are transformed. So Lord, thank you for reminding in all areas of relationship, no matter how good they are, how hard they are, you're able to be glorified. And today our eyes are upon you. Go with us, I pray. Guide us, direct us all. Lord, we love you and we thank you for helping us to live life, say it with me, different. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you all.